Ich, ich möchte es klar definieren. Sanktionen I want to define it clearly. Sanctions are actually an economic war. We are participating in a war that is not fought with military weapons, but with economic means. This means trying to bring an opponent to their knees economically. And that clearly contradicts neutrality. Hello everyone. This is Pascal Lotter from Neutrality Studies once again. Today I have with me Professor Dr. Heinrich Wollmeyer. He is an agricultural scientist, but has also been involved with issues of agricultural and social policy for many years. He is a strong advocate of Austrian neutrality and has been pointing out the gradual integration of Austria into NATO for many years, as well as the dependence of European countries on US foreign policy. Professor Dr. Wollmeyer, welcome. Herr Professor Dr. Wohlmeier, herzlich willkommen. Hallo, freut mich, dass ich I'm glad I get to talk with you. I always regret that neutral Austria and neutral Switzerland don't have a chair for neutrality at their universities. While that's possible in Japan. In Japan das möglich ist. Es ist es ist eine Forschungsstelle im Moment, aber vielleicht wird noch ein richtiger Lehrstuhl. It is a research position at the moment, but maybe it will become a proper professorship. I wanted to ask you about that. We met in another online conversation when we were with various other people. You made very interesting observations there about the notion that neutrality should not only be understood in the narrow military sense, as Switzerland and Austria do. Both say, we don't supply weapons, so we are still neutral. At the same time, however, they impose sanctions against Russia and other countries that are classified as hostile by NATO and the USA. How do you defend the view that neutrality should also be practiced in the economic sphere by neutral countries? I want to define this clearly. Sanctions are actually economic warfare. We are participating in a war that is not fought with military weapons, but with economic means. This means trying to force an opponent to their knees economically. This clearly contradicts neutrality. We Austrians gained our freedom because we promised perpetual neutrality. This promise is currently being broken by Austria and Switzerland as we are participating in the sanctions, and thus are effectively a party to the war. You mentioned that these wars occur on different levels. Why do you think it is so easy for the Austrian and also the Swiss government to say that we are only militarily neutral? Economically, we are absolutely fine with participating in the sanctions, even though it is clearly a case of a great power conflict where we are taking sides. I believe it is self-deception. One wants to muddle through with the claim that economic sanctions do not violate neutrality. In reality, every lawyer who understands the matter says that this clearly contradicts neutrality. The Russians have responded by saying that Switzerland and Austria are no longer neutral states for them. They are no longer states that can truly act neutrally between the parties, mediate, and initiate dialogues. I believe that is clearly recognizable. Where does this change come from? If I may elaborate briefly, do you remember how Austria's neutrality was declared and announced in 1955? In the 1960s, Bruno Kreisky and other statesmen of Austria skillfully used neutrality to navigate through the Cold War. Then that era ended and the post-war period began. A change occurred, so that today both Austria and Switzerland feel that neutrality is almost indecent. How did this ideological shift come about? Wann kam oder wie kam dieser ideologische Wandel zustande? I believe we witnessed a media initiative by the USA 
in reality, by NATO, where everyone who doesn't belong to the good side was assigned to the bad side. It was said that if you are for the good, you must at least participate with non-military measures. I think it started back then that we didn't resist this media offensive. I have always said we must commit to comprehensive neutrality. We Austrians would have fared well even today if we had said, as neutrals, we cannot participate in the sanctions against Russia. Then we would also have no energy crisis and no trade crisis, and we could truly mediate. It is very clear that three peace initiatives regarding Ukraine were actively blocked by the West. We should have intervened and said that this dialogue is peace-bringing. We should have offered our good offices to bring this dialogue to a successful conclusion. Instead, we allowed ourselves to be drawn into the smear campaign against Russia. However, one must credit the Austrian government and Chancellor Nehammer for being the first European statesman, that is, EU statesman, to fly to Moscow in 2022 and actually hold talks there. He was heavily criticized for this in Austria, especially because he spoke with a dictator viewed as evil. But that surprised me. Do you think a piece of Austrian neutrality in the international arena was still shining through there? Or how did you assess this event? I viewed it positively, but he then withdrew due to the overall criticism from the West. Nahammer is actually an officer of the Federal Army, and we have already oriented the Federal Army strongly towards the West. I was surprised at the time, that was about 10 years ago. Back then, Ursula von der Leyen was the Minister of Defense in Germany, and she participated in a discussion with the Federation of Austrian Industries. At that time, we concluded no less than 40 cooperation agreements with the German Bundeswehr. And I told her back then, Miss von der Leyen, you are actually a charming warmonger. To which she replied, that's what you said. And I responded, I say this to you as someone convinced of neutrality. I have to tell you something else. My great uncle Julius Rob, who negotiated the state treaty, initiated negotiations with the Russians against all Western reservations. He once told me, if Konrad, that was Adenauer, had offered the Russians neutrality, they would have long since had peace and a good relationship with the Russians. Because the Russians' interest at that time was very clear, a neutral corridor between East and West to eliminate mutual threats, that was the line. There are wonderful studies on this. One comes from a very good Austrian researcher, whose name I have now forgotten. In any case, there are studies that are still trying to determine whether the offer from the Russians back in 1952-53 in the Stalin note was serious or not. Peter Ruggenthaler, an Austrian researcher, says it was not serious. However, there are also researchers who say it was serious. It was just not well executed. And you also say your great uncle was the convincing one. In reality, it was like this. My uncle was friends with and in contact with the Finnish president Kekkonen, who was well acquainted with the Russians. The Finns had to find a way to get along with the Russians, even though the Russians had stolen a third of their country after World War II. Kekkonen told him there was now a moon window because the Russians wanted to prove their peacefulness and neutrality. You should take advantage of this now. The messages were delivered by courier because everything was being monitored, both the teletypes and the phone calls. As a result, we began negotiating with the Russians through our ambassador Bischoff, who actually looked like Mikoyan. He convincingly made them believe that Vienna was east of Prague. Wien östlich von Prag liegt und wenn wir die Neutralität anbieten, 
And if we offer neutrality, then we have a neutral wedge between Lake Geneva and Lake Nocetal in NATO, splitting it. This must be in the military interest of the Russians, but it must also be in our interest because we can increase our prosperity with it. In the state treaty, we also took on military restrictions that would still apply today. The state treaty is deposited in Moscow, and Russia is the successor state of the Soviet Union. Julius Robb said about this, we calmly accept it, because we invest the money that we would otherwise spend on armaments in the prosperity of the people. The best national defense is a satisfied, ready-to-defend population. We also saw in Vietnam that a superior military power could not defeat a popular uprising. It is essentially the same strategy that Japan pursued after World War II. All right, then we limit our defense spending. They agreed on a balance with the Americans, where the Americans were contractually bound to defend Japan, but the model was the same. By the way, this is something the Americans regret very much today. They want the Japanese to spend more money. That is currently changing. In Europe, Everything is changing in such a way that the wind blowing from America and NATO is not only directed against Russia, but also against anything neutral. The success of bringing Sweden and Finland into NATO was celebrated everywhere, often with derision towards Russia. People said, look, things are even worse for you now. A neutral Ukraine was actively prevented, as we now know, by the British and Americans. We are at a point where even a neutral Europe is under Western pressure. Can we say that? Yes, I believe that the USA, due to its enormous debt of over $35 trillion, which is referred to as trillions in English, needs adversarial conflict. Therefore, they try to brand all neutrals who prevent this as cowards and accomplices of evil in order to force them into their camp. In my last lecture at Courage for Ethics last Sunday, I said that the USA is in a desperate situation since the Saudis terminated the ironclad agreement and the defense agreement with the USA on September 9th. These agreements had the condition that the Saudis, as the largest oil exporters, would only invoice oil in dollars. Therefore, the indebted dollar is under full pressure. The USA, in its desperation, is becoming increasingly aggressive, even against the neutrals who thwart their strategy of force. Do you feel that neutral Austria and neutral Switzerland can still maintain their neutrality? Or is the pressure from NATO already so great that it's only a matter of time before they have to give up their neutrality? In Switzerland, I hope that the neutrality referendum will be successful. We know from Switzerland and Austria that a good 90% of the population is in favor of perpetual comprehensive neutrality. They feel and understand this, and therefore I have hope that the strategy of integration into NATO will not be successful. The problem in Switzerland is that the referendum will probably not take place until next year. But I believe the signal of over 130,000 signatures, 100,000 would have been necessary, is a significant signal for politics. We must primarily clarify that the media policy of the USA and NATO operates very cleverly with the distortion of terms to lull us. For example, the rapprochement treaty with NATO was called Partnership for Peace, which in reality is the opposite. It is participation in a war alliance. Unfortunately, NATO has transformed from a defense alliance into a war alliance. This can be seen in several instances. 
One of the most significant actions of NATO for me was the war in Yugoslavia in 1999. After that, Kosovo was practically made into a colony. There was no public referendum. Only selected parliamentarians were allowed to vote on independence. Subsequently, the largest military base in Europe, Bonsteel, was promptly established in the north of Macedonia. The strategy was to establish a land bridge to the Middle East, where they are also involved in Israel. The now 96-year-old Austrian officer said 20 years ago, Dear friend, Israel is actually the land-based aircraft carrier of the USA in the Middle East, with which they try to dominate this region. However, this plan is now collapsing because the Arab states are uniting and distancing themselves from the USA. See the termination of the petrodollar agreement by the Saudis. Therefore, the actions of the USA are becoming increasingly desperate. And it's no longer clear who controls whom. When you look at the kind of support Mr. Netanyahu receives in the American capital, it's no longer clear to me who is giving orders to whom. The integration of these two states has reached a new level. But if we go back to Europe and ask ourselves where this change of mind comes from, as well as the distortion of terms, it becomes interesting. Many of these terms, like the Partnership for Peace, had legitimacy after 1991. Even Russia joined the Partnership for Peace because it was thought that this could be a vehicle for security cooperation. Currently, there is a lot of discussion in Switzerland about cooperation with NATO. At every level, there is a desire to cooperate with NATO because it supports peace and security. This is the mental construct being built. At the same time, this integration also promotes dependency. Deployment potentials abroad must also be prepared. This should actually scare people, but it doesn't. There are various reports from the Swiss Federal Council, our national government, stating that we should be ready to conduct operations with NATO partners outside Swiss borders when the time comes. This is clearly stated in these state documents today. Because all of this is happening under the label of cooperation, few people are worried. Why? I believe the essential point is that people in the media have been successfully led to believe that NATO stands for human rights and democracy. Putin has been demonized and portrayed as the head of evil to push through this strategy of fighting for democracy and freedom. In reality, there is far less democracy in the West than we would like to assume. In the USA, it is actually the deep state, the military-industrial complex, that governs. Dwight Eisenhower warned about this as early as 1961. He said that this military-industrial complex needs wars to exist. And once we understand that the U.S. military-industrial complex needs wars and wants to draw us into war readiness and war tolerance with cunning and deceit, then we have the necessary intellectual tools. That's how it should be seen. We must massively enlighten people that we are succumbing to a deceitful strategy here. One can govern against the majority, but not against the majority that is informed and determined. Our task now is to enlighten people. I do this as an older man at every opportunity. In reality, we are succumbing to a deceitful aggression strategy in the humanitarian guise of democracy, human rights, and freedom. The wolf in sheep's clothing, the war wolf in humanitarian sheep's clothing. This narrative is very successful. We in Europe buy into it as well. The Americans, and especially NATO, are extremely savvy sellers. They are very good at getting their message across to men and women. Therefore, the question always arises of how the narrative changes when something doesn't quite fit the concept. I would like to ask you a question. I don't know how it was in the Austrian news yesterday, 
but Mr. Putin was in Mongolia yesterday on September 3rd. We are recording this video on September 4th. Zeichnen dieses Video auf am 4. September. Gestern war er in der Mongolei. Und es war ein Aufschrei, weil die Mongolei eigentlich zum internationalen Strafgericht. And that was an outcry because Mongolia actually belongs to the International Criminal Court. It would have been obliged to arrest Mr. Putin, as the court has issued a warrant for his arrest. However, Mongolia is a good democracy. It is sandwiched between China and Russia, yet it is highly democratic with a multi party system, similar to Europe and also very free, a truly good democracy. How was this reported in the Austrian news yesterday? How was it portrayed? Because here, a democracy did not do what one would expect from any European state in Western Europe. It was actually reported neutrally and noted that Mongolia is not ready to execute the arrest warrant of the International Criminal Court. I told my friends that there is a criminal who cannot be held accountable by the International Criminal Court. That is the USA, because they have never signed and ratified the statute of the International Criminal Court, even though it is enshrined in the United Nations Charter. I believe this will be well received. Yeah. Das kommt, glaube ich, gut an. Ja, also eben die, die, diese, diese Komponente des internationalen Rechts. Yes. So this component of international law is another story. I just wanted to know how it is presented. It's not that the European media always spread a single narrative. But in general, the media in Austria, as well as in Switzerland, are quite attuned to a certain perspective, especially regarding the Ukraine war. Are there many media outlets you know of that try to shed light on the background? I believe the reporting was neutral on our part. It was not condemned. That is pleasing. One was rather surprised that Mongolia dared to do it. Now, one should tell all fellow citizens, Mongolia dared to do it. Why don't you dare to do it? There is the possibility of saying we should use more diplomacy. Switzerland launched an initiative at this peace summit, but it was more or less dominated by the USA, NATO and Ukraine. Russia wasn't even invited. Do you see ways in which Austria could further advocate for peace? For example, by joining Hungary and trying to exert pressure within the EU to initiate high-level talks. I hope for the elections that those parties advocating for neutrality and for breaking away from NATO servitude will gain votes. This would force the established parties to reconsider how they shape politics in the future. I have a small glimmer of hope that something will change. When are the elections taking place in Austria? Now on September 29th. There are many elections coming up, including in Georgia on October 26th. This will again reveal a lot about the local conditions. Do you feel that in the relationship with Germany, between Austria and Germany, there could still be some movement in the bilateral relations? Could Austria persuade Germany to stop supplying all types of weapons to Ukraine? Or is there not much contact anymore? I have more of an observation about a friend who drives trucks. He noticed that armored personnel carriers are continuously being produced at OAF, which we deliver to Germany. These are then actually delivered to Ukraine. This means Austria tolerates out of selfish economic interests that we deliver weapons to third countries. We claim these countries are peaceful, but in reality, the weapons go elsewhere. Additionally, we tolerate NATO transports being routed through Austria, 
including tanks and sealed soldiers. The Hungarians have the problem that previous governments joined NATO out of fear of Russia. Therefore, Orban has to tolerate military transits and can only counteract on a diplomatic level. This is the big problem Hungary currently has, the burden of NATO membership from previous governments. On the other hand, it gives him the opportunity to participate in NATO meetings in Washington, as recently happened, and to be present there. At the moment, it is also evident that the Russians do not necessarily reject a NATO member as a dialogue partner. Mr. Orban was even warmly received in Moscow. The only real peace talks that had a genuine chance of establishing peace took place in April 2022 in Istanbul, Turkey. Turkey is also a NATO member. How do you see the future of NATO, which does not quite behave as one would expect if it were completely under American control? There are dissenters. I believe that this disintegration of NATO is happening gradually because people are beginning to understand how much they are being exploited for the goals of the USA. It's about forcibly maintaining the current world domination system. They are looking at the BRIC countries which are currently growing massively and saying that if we think logically, we must allow the USA an honorable exit from world domination. I have always said that we need a global currency agreement with a debt cut and the introduction of an international clearing union, as John Maynard Keynes once conceived. However, this idea was not only rejected by the USA, but also undermined through deceit. We need to bring this topic back into discussion. The West must recognize that it actually only makes up 8% of the world's population and cannot act dominantly towards others. Instead, they should be technologically advanced and good trading partners. We must finally start to understand the USA better. I have to think about who said it. It was even in the middle of the last century when a scientist suggested that Russia should actually be the bridge to China. What we are currently doing is driving the Russians into the arms of the Chinese. The Americans have openly admitted in the Defense Committee that their strategy is to wear down and weaken the Russians so that they can then focus on their future main adversary, China. I wonder why China is considered the main adversary. Again, this is a question of money and economics. We must acknowledge that the Chinese are on the move again, and their declared goal is to become the economic superpower of the world. It is possible to cooperate with them peacefully. I have a friend, the industrialist Cornelius Group, whose son Leopold studied in China for a while. He said that when you get closer to the young intellectual Chinese, they have a strong will at heart. This means they want to avenge the humiliations of the 18th and 19th centuries, which also extended into the 20th century. But they want to do this in a peaceful way by becoming economically stronger. And I believe there is only one strategy here. We should focus on cooperation, recognize the Chinese as equal partners, and tell them that we want to resolve this peacefully. Unfortunately, I suspect that the USA and NATO might provoke the Russians into a desperate move. Then the Chinese could seize the opportunity to stab the Russians in the back, as they have long wanted to claim the Amur region for themselves. There are even Chinese maps on which this area is already marked as Chinese territory. That would astonish me, because the Chinese have a great interest in ensuring that the Russians are not crushed by NATO in a major war. They have never clashed with the Russians in this area when it comes to territorial conflicts. Therefore, 
I hope that such a thing will not happen. But I also have the concern that the Americans want to drive the Russians to a desperate act by exerting pressure on Russian territory through Ukraine and with long-range missiles. Perhaps there is something else to add. Much of what we hear in the West also contains projection. The Americans and Europeans know that they have often converted economic power into military power themselves. In the worst case, this happened through direct colonial rule. That's why the Chinese are accused of wanting to do the same. This leads to this block mentality, either us or them. Do you see it that way too? I believe the USA needs to demonize the Chinese for their anti-China strategy, similar to what they do with the Russians. We must resist this. We should also oppose projects like the Silk Road, where the Chinese act very ruthlessly in the West. In Africa, they offer low-cost loans, but with the condition that if they cannot be repaid, the investments become Chinese property. This means they are pursuing a strategy of control. We can only counter this by demanding fair trade conditions. And I have always said, we need investments. This is covered in the WTO under GATT. GATT is indeed a part of the WTO. It was established that we can demand that free market access is only granted if the ecological and social standards of the destination country are adhered to in the production of the products. This is secured. If we introduce this principle, and conduct trade peacefully with the Chinese on this basis, then I believe we can enter a period of peace. I hope that this period of peace will come soon, especially for Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Professor Wallmeyer, thank you very much for your time today. We will talk again another time. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts. If you value our translations, please consider supporting us on Patreon. The link is in the description. Thank you very much.